Manscaped are the new sponsors of My Best 11 podcast. These guys are absolutely awesome. Ping this across to myself and Marv not that long ago and look at this package. The biggest thing in here and the most important thing is this. This razor is amazing. I mean, just look at it. The lawnmower. Trimming is perfect. Look at it. Look at the light. How awesome is that? So if you're struggling to see exactly where you're going, can't quite get exactly where you need to be, the light is perfect. So the lawnmower 3.0 with your manual comes inside the box. The best bit, we got some undies in here, boxers, briefs, jocks, depends on where you live in the world. That's what they're called there. We've also got across here, we've got ball toner in a beautiful spray. They reckon use this once a week, maybe a little bit more recently. It's up to you. Absolutely brilliant in there. And then they have the ball deodorant. Can't quite get it out right now, but the ball deodorant in there. I don't even know they made this stuff. This is absolutely incredible. And I think this is going to be a fantastic partnership that we have with these guys. And then underneath here, absolutely beautiful, beautiful bag to stick your stuff in and to take with you whenever you go away on holiday great toiletries bag in there so that's the first look myself and marv will have a proper look at all this over the coming weeks as we unpack all this but we like to say thanks so much to the guys over at manscaped and manscaped i'm in australia manscaped sent across to marv based in the us but they are across the world now um, and look out on our social media feed for some fantastic offers. And of course, if you want to get 20% off and free delivery and you'll support the podcast, um, use the code MYBEST11POD inside there, inside the promo code, and you'll get 20% off whatever you want. Excellent. So, welcome to another episode of My Best 11 podcast. Today we are joined um, by the current Burnley manager, um, who, as time of recording, has just managed to turn over um, apparently the most difficult place to go to in the country. Um, and he's, but we're here to talk about his playing career, um, who started off under Brian Clough at Forest, then went across to Chesterfield, Bristol City, spent a little bit of time at Luton, where our co-host Marv met him. Um, properly. Millwall, um, that yellow team down the road, which he's managed as well, which we're not going to mention. We're not allowed to mention their name at all. Um, and then finished his career at Northampton. Sean Dyche, how are you, sir? Good, thank you. Good, good, good. Excellent. Marv, how are you? I'm excited, Andrew. This is, I mean, it's just, I mean, People are not going to realise. I haven't. I don't, I don't really speak to like Daishi as like. But we just been on the phone about five ten minutes ago, and it's like <laughs> we're old mates sort of thing. And that's the greatest thing I can say about one. You know, when you're like a, an ex footballer, or whatever you want to call it, and you and you like reconnect with someone, it's like you just were speaking to him yesterday, and that's what it was like with me and Daishi. And it's fantastic. I think, I think the thing is, I Marv, as I've got older, you know, being at Luton for that little spell. Um, really rejuvenated my career. It was really important because if you remember, I'd had a beast at Bristol City, I was getting battered. So I came out of there and went to Luton on loan and you were so courteous in making me look like a world beater next to you. Um, and that allowed me to sort of remodel my career from there on in and it, it rebirthed me as a footballer. So that three months was really important, actually. You know, we were 50 minutes from where our families were from, which at the time was important. Great group of lads, as you know. Lenny was Fantastic. brilliant with me and with us. So... It was actually, even though it was a short window, I, I remember it were really fun times. I'd always get slaughtered off the Watford fans for saying that, but you know, I always tell the truth, and I remember it were really yeah, good yeah. moments. That is the one thing about Daishi, he always tells the truth, and, and, he, and he says it how it is, and that's why I think, I mean, going back, I thought you signed for, I mean, I thought you signed for Luton. I mean, I look back and I thought to myself, yeah, it was at Luton, and he was here for, and I saw the loan, it was only three months. It was only three months, and and you don't and like you said, you connected with all of us, and you came in, and it's like you're one of us. 
Do you know what I mean? You was like part of the family straight away and you just embedded everything what we did. Yeah, well, I, I come in for Steve Davis, who, who ironically ended up going to Burnley. Um, I thought he was a fantastic player, mate. I really did. I thought, what a player. If he, being a bit harsh, if he had another extra yard of pace, I think he'd have, I think he'd have been a top player. What a player True. he was. And yeah. then they had to put it with me. Um, and I was kind of just, re, you know, coming out of a real horrible spell at Bristol City and I came remember. to you guys. And it was yeah. a... It was like a really young group, apart from, you know, me, you and a couple of others. It was quite a young group, but there was a nice energy about it. Some real carrots in there. And it just it just took a load off me. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really did. And it was a very important part of my career looking back. That three months, you know, got me back yeah. going, got me fit, got my energy and my confidence back up. And then I got a move off the back of that to Millwall and, you know, did well there. So it was, it was a really important three months, that. It's fantastic. Uh, definitely. So... Those people that haven't listened to the podcast before, what we do is we go through all the way from, um, and we get Sean to name his best 11 players who he's ever set foot over the white line um, and played with. As we go along, Sean may try and give us a few few guess, uh, sorry, a few clues and see if we can work out the players that he's talking um, about. So when you're ready, um, first of all, we always like to ask, and you're a manager at the moment, what formation have you gone for and has the formation been created by the players or have you stuck to, are you one of these rigid managers? Bear in mind, this is fantasy football. So have you gone kind of 1-1-8 one, one, because you love the strikers? Well, to be fair, bear in mind that everyone says I'm a rigid manager anyway. It wouldn't be a surprise to you that I've gone for a 4-4-1-1 stroke 4-4-2 four, four, uh, with a bit more flexibility than people probably give us credit for in my actual life as a manager. Um, but no, it's a format I like playing in. I played with players who I've chosen who I think fitted that format and some very good ones, I hope you'll agree, over this, this uh, next little while when we're talking about it. OK, let's start with the goalkeeper then. Go. Right, so, so um, you definitely know, Marv, so that's a, a clue in itself, you definitely know this goalkeeper. Um, he became and still is a very good friend as well as a very good goalkeeper. Um, He's probably approaching 800 league games, I think, by the end. Something like 785 league games. Played He's at still many not playing, is he? No, no, no. Played at many different oh. clubs. Um, very keen golfer. Top man. Very level, steady fella. Um, and you, he I think you played with him. Did he? Oh, did I? He didn't play for the other team down the road as well, did he? Mm. He did. Yes, I think so. Is as well. Yes. Yeah, go on, Andrew. Say it. Alec Chamberlain. Yes. So Al, Al was. Uh, so when I went to Watford, um, Al was living in Northampton, and I was living round in Kent because I was at Millwall. Then when I moved round, um, Chamber was living in Northampton. I ended up moving back to Northampton because I said about half an hour from Kettering. So we car shared for virtually my whole time at Watford. Then. I went to Northampton as a player, then went back to Watford as a coach. So then we were sort of car sharing and stuff again. Um, so I played with him. I thought he was an excellent keeper. I thought he's a very grounded fella as well. Very, you know, very genuine, just a top bloke. Um, and we spent a lot of time together. You know, there's other keepers, I must say, I could have put in who are very good keepers as well. But because of my connection with him, as well as, you know, um, as a bloke, as well as playing with him, um, right. you know, fine servant to virtually every club he'd been at. And you know what? Because I think he was gonna um, gonna come on here, and he still is gonna come on here, but like it's just not worked out. <laughs> and I was doing my research as I do. I didn't know, right? And I'm, I was I was shot. Liverpool. He went to Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. He, and he was on the bench for the what was it? Was it one of the um the league cup? Was it the league cup? Or was it, I don't know. Or was it in yeah, Europe? Something, anyway, something I, like that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, something like. I was shocked. I was shocked. Yeah, yeah. I thought, oh my gosh. No, he had, he had an unbelievable career. I mean, you know, like I say, he was, I think he was still on the players' sort of side of things, even though he was a coach at like 39, you know, 39, 40. Um, super fit fella. I do remember he was a really fit fella. Yeah, As yeah, he was, he was always fit, but like you said, yeah. top straight down the, night, the middle guy who was just like, yeah. just, just so easy to get on with. So easy yeah. to get on. And he you know? still is. Still is top yeah. fella. Um, he's, he's, now, he's now doing some on the recruitment side for us, some scouting. Yeah, he said, and in and yeah. for Wales as well, I think as well. Oh, he was right. Yeah, 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 and, and, and with the under twenty one, the goalkeeper. So yeah, that's right. So I'll start with Alec Chamberlain in goal. Oh, Perfect. Great start, great start. So we'll go right back. Okay, another 
Um, you'd have definitely played against him. Uh, a legend in his own right at his club. Um, I played with him and enjoyed everything about him, both as a, as a bloke and as a player. Um, very underrated. There's a clue in that. Mostly underrated as a footballer, but highly rated as a defender. Um, Was he an international? Oh, I don't, um, don't think so, no. Okay, <clears throat> all right. I'm, I've moved out who I was thinking. I was underrated. Really, re I'll, give you, I'll give you a clue. Fantastic. The best I've seen 1v1. As defending 1v1. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I was going to go Boise. Yeah. Did you play with Boise? He was a young kid coming through when I was there. Ah, uh, okay. <clears throat> He's one of these young whippersnappers. 1v1, really? Mm. He scored, he scored a very famous first goal. Famous for the reason of how long it took for him to score that goal. Jesus, these are good little clues he's given us as well. And we're incredibly <laughs> famous. When he scored, it almost made news across football because it was that long until he scored his first goal. But he was such a legendary sort of local figure. No, I've, I've, I've gone. I've lost it. Stephen, it Stephen Carr? I've got Stephen Carr. No, do not say it? Yeah, go on. Lloyd Doyley at Watford. You know what? I'm not, I mean, just say it, Marv. I wouldn't have got it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, would, no. I knew someone there, but I wouldn't have got his name. I mean, I, 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 Lloyd, Lloyd was Lloyd was so underrated. You know, you know, Marv. Because when you when you when you ask me to put a, a side together, you know, like so. I'll give you an example, right? So someone I could put, or I consider a better footballer. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and a top was, was Lucas Neal, right? So I played with right. Lucas Neal. But but. When you talk about playing alongside someone and someone who you thoroughly enjoy playing alongside with and you trusted and you thought, what a, you know, so underrated, I'm telling you, Lloyd Doyle Bardner, brilliant lad, fantastic professional, awesome 1v1, would never let you down. The number of times I used to turn around and he'd be jumping and heading it off the back stick when I'm out of position. And I used to think, he keeps me on the team, people like him. And you know, my boys are like, get him tucked in, you know, I mean, I go, Lloyd, get in here, get in here. And he'd be in here, and then he'd be stopping the man crossing it. I used to love it. I used to go, Lloyd, you'll do for me, son. So, do you know, how long was it then before he scored his first goal? Do you know? It was something crazy, like, because he nearly scored when I was playing with him. Um, but it was something like, I don't know, like 267 games oh. or something. I was something mad. And I was, so I had the, one, of, one of my highlight moments that didn't involve me, if you like, was Lloyd Doyle scoring, because I was with Malcolm Mackay, I think it was, as, as a, um, assistant manager. Yeah, and he scored. I've never known an atmosphere change like it was the weirdest thing. That the crowd always went silent. They were so shocked, and then they just went mental. You know what I mean? It was the weirdest moment. I loved it. I was—I can honestly tell you. I told me that story when they sat up for one of my when I wasn't, you know, physically involved in the moment. That yeah, my definite highlights were seeing him score a goal, and he's a brilliant fella as well. Oh, that's great. So he played at right back, right. and obviously you played right hand side of the centre. Is that right? No, no, I used to play left a lot. Not not with Marv, obviously, but I used to play left quite a lot because I was I could hoy it with me left foot. I could throw me left foot on it. So I was I was quite comfortable on that side. Oh, okay, so you tended to play more with the left. So you, you tucked in the left back a bit more. You were yeah, yeah. With, with Lloyd, right I played the right. Yeah. With Lloyd, I played a bit more on the right. We're mixed between the two. Uh, but yeah. yeah, generally, I'd play on the left. And trust me, that left back, he'd be covering me. Don't worry about that. It'd be four <laughs> yards from me. Marvel tell you, Marvel tell you. We didn't used to let him go anywhere, Marvel, did we? No, Andrew, <laughs> let, me, let me just say, right, obviously everyone remembers <laughs> Daishi when, at um, Chesterfield and the, the semi-final stuff. And I remember when um, Lenny goes, oh, look, I've got um, a lad coming in on, on loan. He's going like, to really like help us out and like be solid and strong. And, and he went, it's like Sean Dyche. And I'm thinking, I know Sean Dyche. He's, uh, he's like, he's like, he might, I thought he's like a bit of a stopper. That's what I thought. Do you know what? When he come and he start, we started playing in training, this is how professional he is. In training, he had all the tricks, the drag backs and stuff. When it comes to the game, you didn't see none of that. Not, but that's how, that's, that's, that's the respect for this guy, right? I'm thinking, whoa, Dyche, where's that come from in training? Like, and it's next to me, it's like, I've got it in the locker, Marv. I've got it in the locker, son. I just don't, do, I just don't want to use it. Just don't want to use it unless I have well, to, he said. You know, Marv, now and again, in the role that I do, 
you get a bit more of an in-depth interview, if you know what I mean. You know, most people yeah, just yeah, want yeah. to throw away clickbait. But now and again, they do like a piece on you. And I'd actually say to them, I go, what you, what you didn't, you know, people who know me, like, you remember Lee Glover, right? Me and Lee Glover, yeah, we grew up. Yeah, Glover, yeah, football. yeah. And Lee Glover would say, I'd tell people in interviews, they just laugh. Right? I, was, I was literally like a, a tricky little midfield player when I was young. So no, I, I, made a, I made a, yeah, I made a conscious decision to do the job that I did because I thought it had, it had enhanced my career. When I was at Chesterfield, right, and you're trying to get out of Chesterfield and climb the ladder, I thought, what's really going to get me noticed? In, in, the, in the third and second division in them days, you ain't getting noticed because you're doing drag backs on a, on a pitch that looks like it's black because of mud. You know, you're going to get noticed because you can lead and you can edit and you can defend. And you... So in the end, I just formed that. The lads at Mill used to buzz off there, Reedy and them, because I used to take free kicks now with my left foot, and Reedy used to go, you can actually play with that really young, like voice you know like almost like yeah. surprise like yeah can play. i know so yeah we've all had a past you know we all were that kid in the playground who could dribble through everyone you know what i mean at least to wet himself it's so true yeah, i made i made a conscious decision to play the way i yeah. played because i thought it was effective Similar please thing, yeah. tell me you still do that on the burnley training ground do you get the ball every now oh, and again just go i've still got it boys i i swear to you i um when i finished playing I was properly done, right? I'd, I'd, I knew it, the fire was out, in me to play, that is, not to coach and everything. And I've never played a game since the day I finished. And the, the, my last ever game in the first team, right, was Blackpool away for Northampton. It's a true story. I knew the fire had gone out. I rang my missus. I didn't even want to play. And I played. I gave away a penalty and scored an own goal and we lost forward. <laughs> what a way to finish your career. It's your last way to finish your career. What? Whoa. True Unbelievable. Story. True story. And I knew it. I knew before the game, and I knew after. I just said to Jane, my miss, I just went, that's me done. And I knew it. I knew it. So I've never, ever played a single game of football since then. Played a couple of little, not with the, not with the players. I don't, I never joined in with players, but little staff, um, yeah. 5v5s and that. More, more when I was youth team player at Watford, uh, youth team coach at Watford. I right. joined in the odd time with the kids just to show them a, a drill or something, but that was it. I've never played a game since. And I, I, to be fair, my body shot it now. I've got arthritic toes and arthritic back and all that. So, so I couldn't play anyway now. But yeah, true story. Okay. So, do you think that was because you played so badly in that game, or no, no, no? I think before you, Marvel say when or was the it your going, body or mentally or no? When the fire's going out, no, I was in good shape. I was always in good shape. And when the fire's going out inside of you about the passion and the the edge, I call it. Once the edge drops. It's like, you know, the old the easiest one, you know, that you know the boxer when they talk about the eye of the tiger. Well, a version of that, not not like the same, but you know, when that edge of your performance drops and that edge you need to 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 really have that competitive spirit, for me, once that went out, that was me done. You know, I couldn't I couldn't fraud myself and just some players seem to have this way of getting on, they nick another contract, they just carry on. They haven't really got that edge, but they carry on. I just couldn't do that. And I just thought, yeah. that's me done. I was 36, so don't get me wrong, I had a good innings. I mean, I had 20 years, you know, as a pro, so don't get me wrong, I had a, I had a good, good go at it. But no, I was ready. I know, because I thought you were 36 when you come to us. It's a fair one. I looked at it. I moved like a 36-year-old, that's for sure. Right, <laughs> left, left back. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Right. Right. Well, let's keep going, left, left backs. Okay, so... Um, went to a couple of different clubs. I played on his way up the ladder, as in his performances were getting noticed. Quick, he had a toughness to him, he could play. Um, and, and actually, from the time I played with him, his career went on from strength to strength and become a really recognised, you know, high-quality player. And played a lot of football, ended up playing, goodness, till he was 30, probably 8, 39, and, and more or less always in the Premier League or the Championship, I think virtually all of his career. International? He, oh, I don't think I don't think so. No, actually, oh, I don't no. think so. Well, that's my idea. Gone. I reckon I was on the same well, as you, Mark. Yeah, I don't think I got, he got close on a number of occasions. Unless I've got the country wrong, I might. No, I, no, I no. So. You this one. I was thinking of. You've already mentioned him. I was, I thought, was he a midfielder? Lucas Neal. Was he a defender? No. no so Lucas no. Neal. Lucas Neal played well. I played him right back, but he played midfield as well. Oh, I was going um, Ashley Young. No, no, I uh, b believe it or not, I did play with Youngie, but he only played people like him. You see, I class when Marv asked me about my team, I class players I played with a lot and they were, you know, formed players, if you like. Well, Ashley Young made his debut when I was playing at Watford. So he was just a young yeah, that's kid. What I, 
And that's what I thought. That's why I was going left back. I thought because I know he played left back or left wing. No, he, he played. He played right, right side, uh, sort of like right wing, left wing when I was there. Oh, okay. Uh, this is right. going to be tricky then. Um... Strong, strong player, tough tackling, good athlete, um, and, play, and, 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 and played most of his career in the Premiership and Championship. Yep. 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 You'd have definitely come across him, Mark. Definitely at some point or another. You played with him at Millwall. No, I played with him down at that team that you lot um, not so keen on. That's the biggest clue, obviously. Oh, um... I'm surprised you haven't got this one because he's pretty. He had a good career. He moved Neil on. Neil Ardley. So he... Neil Ardley. No, I, I'll tell you what. So he played at like made a real name for himself at West Brom. Played at Birmingham. Played at Watford, obviously. Who's thinking of And I'm thinking. I've got, I've got, I haven't got it. Go on. I mean, go, uh, go on. on. You're going to say it. Paul Who? Robinson. Paul Robinson. Yeah. I played um, left back. Yeah, went from yeah. Watford to West Brom. Yeah. He was a steal. Because yeah. Watford needed the money at the time, he was a steal. He went for like 275 grand or something. You, you know, you knew then, you thought, that's a steal. Right. Really yeah. good player. Could, you know, modern, at that time, like modern fullback could join in. Yeah. It was tough to defend. Good athletically. Um, and really forged his way and had a really good career. But he was um, he was a really good player, I thought. Robinson. I remember, I remember him. Like you said, I probably, yeah, definitely 100% would have played against him. Yeah, I just, didn't, just like when it comes to that team down the road, I just, my mind goes blank. It just, it's like a fog. <laughs> oh, I know about all that. I've had enough stick about that in my time too. Uh, for, even losing for three months, I still got that kind of, oh yeah, because you played for them lot. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, awesome. So let's move on to centre backs. This is where I think we could have a bit more luck. Now, right, so what, what, what Mark, is... I'm going to guess Marvin Johnson first one. I'll oh, start. Well, he's played with. He's not. I know, he's not. He's not one of those ones to be putting people in there just because of the his, his heartstrings are being pulled out. That she's not like that. No, it's a fair one. You're not in it, Mark. So what oh. I would say is this: um, what I've done with it is instead of putting myself in it, of course, because I would. Marv knows that. And Marv, I have put two other centre halves who I played with. Okay, so we'll start on the right side. So the right side centre half for me um, went on to be an international footballer. Um, had a number of clubs which he did well at. He started with me because you need a clue on this one because he started yep. quite lower level, and then a crew I think it was, and we got him out of crew at Chesterfield. So that was why I played with him. <clears throat> Ooh. Ooh. I know about three anyway, came clue. out of group. Here's another clue. He was one of the very early days, the first year of the Bosman ruling. He got a you know decent move at that time from Chesterfield to the rivals down the road again. Really? Oh no. I so oh. I want to say Micah Hyde, but wasn't he a, was he a defender or midfielder? Yeah, no, he's a no, midfielder. He's a midfielder. Sent that back from Chet to go down the road. Go on, go on. No, this is this Mark is Mark Williams. Do you know Mark Williams? Oh yeah, he, 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 he wasn't. Went, uh, he played for he played for um he played for um Ireland as well, didn't he? Did he play for Ireland? No, it was, uh, no, it was, uh, I thought it was Wales. I think I'm pretty sure it's Wales. What? Wales. Oh, well, then Williams. It's going to be Wales. Yeah. So Wales. he was, he was, uh, yeah, he moved, he moved from Chesterfield the first year of the Bosman. He moved to Watford under Graham Taylor when they were in the Premier League. Um, he moved on to Wimbledon as well, had a good career, solid, reliable, strong, you know, tough. He had a toughness yeah. about him, but not, not like, um, I don't mean a toughness like uh, booting people, not that kind of toughness, no. or that, you know, but just a toughness in his, his defending money, you know what I mean? But yeah, again, yeah. A, a few of these. A few of these, you know, people who are watching this, you've got to remember these are these are not. I, mean, I, mean, I could have chose names if you know what I mean. Not you know, course, I played. No. So say like Neil Cox was a really good player. Neil Cox played at like Wimbledon, um, Middlesbrough, and Villa, yeah. and people like that. What the point is, I was trying to pick people who, when I played with them, I thought we had a yep. real connection. You know, and at that time, me and Mark Williams, we were a part of the team that got to the FA Cup semi final at Chesterfield and all that sort of stuff. You know, so we formed a real strong partnership. So that's why. I put together some of these guys, like Lloyd Doyle. You know, I played with Lucas yep. Neal. I thought he was an incredible footballer. 
And when you played with Lloyd Doyle, you respected him way more than it would just be a name on a bit of paper, you know what I mean? Right. Of course. So and that's, that's the way out how we would like it to be done. That's fantastic. Well done. And then playing next yeah. to him on the left-hand side, centre-back, would be uh, a player, yet again, formed a good relationship on pitch with particularly. I thought another one who I thought a few of these players who I thought maybe a little bit underrated. Um, been a, started at a big club at Tottenham and then kind of drifted from there, you know, around. Um, I made a real good relationship with him at Millwall in a very successful side at that time. Nethercott. Yes. Stuart yes. Nethercott. Well done, Andrew. Yes. Well done. So well he done, was Andrew. been at Tottenham and, uh, you know, come out of Tottenham, went to Millwall. Um, I went into Millwall and, you know, I'd, I'd had a really good time at Luton, went into Millwall. My back, which had caused me a lot of problems at Bristol City, went again. So my first year at Millwall was scuppered by injuries. In fact, funny enough, I played my one and only game for Millwall that season was at Luton. I got back after three months with a disc in my back, played my first game at Luton, and then the next week my back went again for the second time. So I virtually had a nightmare. year out. And, oh. <clears throat> excuse me. And it was, a, yeah, it was a nightmare. And people like Stewie Nevercott, I thought very underrated, you know, one of them, Marv, you'll have heard it all before, they'll say, no, he weren't this, he weren't that, he weren't quick, and all this, right. but I tell you, you know, you played alongside him, <clears throat> excuse me, really good defender, better, a better player for doing, I always say do the simple stuff well, he did the simple yeah. stuff really well, not the biggest, but was could edit, he was aggressive, and he was mad as a box of frogs, which made it even funnier, <laughs> so, you know, he literally mad as a box of frogs, which always made me laugh. Couldn't go to it, couldn't room with him because he, he used to want the cur curtains open at night. He couldn't sleep with the curtains closed. Enough. Really? I was so bad, but but so funny. The lads used to buzz off him. So, uh, yeah, so Stewie Nevercott, very underrated in my opinion, and a good yeah. pro and, uh, and did, you know, did the job right, I thought. I remember him as a kid, he used to have massive curtains, didn't he? Kind of blonde yeah, right, yeah. or big angel swings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He was, he was yeah. actually. He did play a bit for Tottenham, but it gets, you know, it was a good side then. It was a hard Tottenham side to get into, and he, uh, he did play a bit at Tottenham. But just, yeah, again, I thought he was underrated. Um, so, yeah, that's my keeper on my back four. So, I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Of those two, who would you rather play with if you sit next to yourself? Oh, uh, well, probably... Oh, I don't know, actually. Probably, I could I could say either different characters, different types of players. Probably just because I was playing at a higher level with Stuart Nevercott at that time. We got in the championship and we were very close to getting promoted. We made the playoffs against Birmingham, um, lost in the playoffs semi-final, as it were, type thing. So probably him just because I, you know, I played at a higher level at a different stage in my career. Um, so, yeah, probably, probably Stuart Nevercott. But I did mention him. I think Neil Cox was a really good player. A really good player, Neil Cox. So... But different type of reason why I've put these guys in. But, but Neil Cox is a really good player. If it went on just football talent, then I'd probably say Neil Cox because he could play Cox. He was a real good player. Very interesting. So, Daishi, just want to take you back to um, when you were saying about you as a little nippy midfielder and stuff. So, you started off at Forest. Now, how did that come about? Was that something which you had aspirations and wanting to be a, a professional football player as a kid? Or it was a case where you just got spotted and someone... So like, yeah, I was there. Uh, yeah, so I started at Nottingham Forest when I was in '87, and that was in the Clough area uh, era. Sorry, but I was I was a midfield player, more of a you know pastor, um, and I, I really got scouted, you know, because Ketrin. Let's face it, it's not a hub of football, Ketrin. But but luckily, I was I was in a good side at that time for our district, as it was then. Scouts were all around it. I was I got picked up by a few different clubs. I, you remember Marvel? Well, you would remember actually. You're old enough, but. So say like um, that time, I know you remember Knox County had a really good youth system. They were always renowned for their youth system, yeah. even more so than Forest. And I started at Knox County as about 12 or 13 years old. That was the first club I ever got scouted for. And then I went to Leicester and the likes and Villa and all that. And then Forest came along and I had a real good connection who became a big friend of mine, still is, is Gary Charles. And I had a real good connection with him. You know, you go to a, in them days, right, you go on trial, Marvel, no, you go on trial and you kind of just get lobbed in like a, Luke, a local uh, hotel or whatever, and you meet these other kids. And me and Charles used yeah. to always come on. Um, so that was a little bit. And the other team that I was close signing for was, was Chelsea. Um, as a kid, not the Chelsea it is now, obviously, it was a different animal then. But I really loved it at Forest, and, and I never regret it. I had, 
I still love Nottingham. It's really close to my heart. It's a, it's a place that I would move to tomorrow. And someone said to me, where do you want to live? I'd say Nottingham right. every time. Because my heartstrings are still there from when I, you know, you got to remember, well, Marvel tell you, when you're an apprentice, it's a really important time of your life, that sort of apprentice to young pro period. So I was in Nottingham from sort of 16 years old to about 24 years old. So they're my formative years, not just on the pitch as a, as a bloke, you know, as a human growing up and maturing. I absolutely love Nottingham and I'd move there tomorrow if I could. Um, so Nottingham, I've always had that connection. Yeah, I've always had that and connection. I was going to say, who, who, which, which apprentices that you were with, who else went on to have a career similar to yourself? Yeah, well, Gary Charles? The, the, the absolute Rolls Royce for me was Gary Charles. I thought he was an absolute Rolls Royce. As a young kid, you just thought, well, you are miles in front of everyone. You know, his pace, his awareness, his... You could more or less play him in any position in the youth team and he'd be top man. You put right. him in goal, he'd probably be brilliant in goal. You know <laughs> what I mean? Um, Lee Glover, of course. Lee Glover was one of the youngest Oops. ever footballers for Nottingham Forest, got in the first team at 16. So I was from a good good couple of years. Steve Stone, who's now one of my coaches here, me and him are big mates. Oh, wow. uh, we were apprentices together. Um, yeah, we had, we had a good few years there where, I mean, a few went into the game and then drifted off like they do. You know, had a couple of years here and there yeah. playing. Um but no, we had, a, we had a real strong couple of years there. And the, 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 the age group just above me was like Mark Crossley. Just above that was Terry Wilson and Steve Chettle. And there was a real good group around that time. It was a great, it was a great right. place. I, I, loved, I loved it on the pitch with what I was doing. And I just loved Nottingham as a place. So it was a really, you know, really important time for me that period. And, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I wouldn't change it for the world, that's for sure. Great. Yeah, excellent. So what we'll do is we're going to pause there, um, have a little outbreak from our sponsors. And then when we come back, we'll hear from the rest of Sean Dyche's best 11. This is the truth. I got my Manscaped way before we started advertising it because I use my Manscaped to shave. Because being an African-American, we have to be careful what we use to shave with because we don't want to get razor bumps and things like that. So I brought this a while ago because it gives me a clean, smooth shave. So, why don't you use the code MYBEST11POD, you get 20% off. Manscaped. So, we're back for part two of our episode with Sean Dyche picking his best 11. So far, uh, we have Alec Chamberlain, Lloyd Doyley, uh, Paul Robinson, Mark Williams, and Stuart Nethercott. So we'll start off looking at the wings or the right midfielders, um, whichever one, whichever side you prefer to start, Sean. Yeah, so I'll start on the right. Um, the a player that played um, with me in a side when he was 16 years old, which is kind of why he gets in there, because I just think that's outstanding in itself, went on to have an amazing career, a total amazing career. I put him in on the wide because he started there, but he ended up being a centre forward. Um, Strong, Mars nodded, Mars knows, I think. Strong, quick, uh, another one who was underrated because people thought he was a bit of a bully of a player, but he had way more than that. Um, and and uh, just, just even looking back then, you know, and you just know, you think, you know, you're 16 and you're playing men's football. And Marvel tell you, that, that Division One, Division Two, but it was then it, Division Two, Division Three, whatever it was called, yeah. tough leagues, you know, really tough leagues. And I saw this young kid and I thought, wow, 16, you're playing men's football. And we were relying on it. We're looking at him thinking, no, oh, we're relying on you. We weren't mollycoddling him. You know, we were relying on him as a, as a man, really, to play. And I thought he was outstanding. You got it, Andrew? Yeah, go on, Marv. Kevin Davis? Yeah. He, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a, like a, a tough, tough-minded kid. Um, I just couldn't believe it. He came on, come on the scene out of sort of nowhere. We'd heard about the youth scene, you know, and he was doing well. And John Duncan, the manager, was almost like, yeah, I'm having him, put him in. And at first, you know, you think, well, you know, we had a hardy group then. There was like Darren Carr, Nicky Law, myself, you know, a real hardened group. And he just took it on. Honestly, I just thought, Phew. it was no surprise to me at all. In fact, the only surprise to me, he didn't go earlier. I thought he'd move earlier because he ended up going for really? South to Southampton. Oh, God, yeah. He ended up going to Southampton for 750,000. Um, and I don't know if you remember his first year or so at Southampton, he was awesome. Um, yeah. He you know, scored a couple of famous goals where he dribbled from the halfway line all the way through and smashed it in the corner and all that. I'd tell you, he's a really good player. And for all they sort of in the end of his career, it was almost like, you know, Sam Allardyce, a bit of a bully and all that, you know, as a player. I'm telling you, he could yeah. play. He was tough, though. He was tough. And he was tough as a kid. And I still see him now and again, you know, now, and like Marvel was saying earlier, it's great because you just... 
click into gear like that, you know, yeah. and I talk as if, you know, call him, we, we used to call him, because he, he always carried a bit of puppy facts, he was young, so we used to call him Jelly, as in Jelly Ass. So even now I still go, all right, Jell, you know what I mean? They need your laughs, because he like, you know, no one ever calls him that, you know what I mean? No one's ever called him that in like 30 years. And you go, all right, Jell. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And people go, why are you calling him Jell? I go, he's Jelly Ass, that's why. You know what I mean? Just silly little <laughs> things like that. The Marvel Day, you know, these old silly little quips, yeah, they yeah. all come to life them when you see people. But top right, player, a really, really good lad as well. Really good lad. Got a lot of time for him. What was he like around the training ground? I mean, he he came across. I mean, like I say, most people have heard of him, um, particularly at the end of his career, starting to get yeah, one or two England caps. I think he got in the end. Um, he was the oldest, he got... he was the oldest ever player to get an England cap. At like thirty. He's what? Yeah. Sorry, Dajun, he was what? I think he was the oldest ever player to get an England cap. An England, you know, uh, first yeah, cap. Yeah. I think it was like really? thirty-one or something. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Mm. What was he like? Was he, did he show leadership when he was growing up? Or no, no? Do you know what? He was quite a quiet lad. Um, just, just part of the group. Went under the radar. Just strong-minded. You just knew he was tough-minded. You know, yeah. like I say, another one. He wasn't tough. I don't mean running around booting people. I mean just a you tough mean that, character. Mental. You know, the way he was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, really tough character. Yeah, a um, lot, lot of respect for him and the career he had, of course. And, and you know, he 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 sort of fell away from it a little bit, and then Sam Allardyce famously got him fit and got him going again, and he never looked back. And his career was always on the up from then on in. But no, I tell you, when you work with these guys, you know, I thought, what a player! Yeah, and, and you and obviously you work quite a bit with youth players at the moment. Do you think that? I mean, we've spoken about it on this podcast a few times with other other managers. We've had uh, Steve Robinson, Graham Alexander, people like that on here, and we talk about the the mental toughness. Do youngsters still have it, or are they? Um, do they not have it anymore? Is it their fault? Is it not their fault? What are your kind of thoughts on that at the moment? I mean, you obviously have quite a lot to do with Burnley young kids. Do you think that mental toughness is still there, where you could get what we call them jelly ass? Not you as a manager, but do you know what I mean that type of thing. No, you got you got to remember that. <clears throat> excuse me, that was that was in the house within the group. Different. And Marv will tell you that the thing that's changed in our careers, and some good, some not so good is that dressing room banter was, was hard, hard internally. But if anyone come from outside your group to inside, oh, no, they're getting, they're getting shooed off, let's say. So you could say what you wanted to your mates inside of your group, but people come from the outside on a night out or anything, no, no, no that ain't happening. You know what I mean? They ain't joining in. So it was like this unwritten code, you know, and I think that's died down a little bit, and I don't think that's a good thing. I think it, it was good that the mentality of the group was an important factor in our successes in our day. Um, that being said, look, the academy process has been brilliant for so many people in so many ways. The facilities, the the uh, educational side of it, the football education as well. The downside is it's it's too pure, it's too mollycoddled, it's too system oriented. You know, the the players of our game he wants immediate feedback from the coach. So guess what? He feels better. He goes home and gets on his PlayStation. Well, in our day, we got absolutely ripped a new one, and it took me yeah. two days just to work it all out. And then to get your confidence back up, to go back in, it builds resilience. Now, my point is, I'm not saying we want to go back to that, but we've got to just find a better balance, I believe, in, in all of what we do with these young players. A bit more, I call it push and pull. You know, pull back enough to allow them room to breathe and a bit of feedback and give them some education, but push them hard enough where they know what the truth of being a professional footballer is. Because the thing that people forget when these young players, right, so they... Bring them up through the academy system and, oh, no, we can't do that. We can't do this. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to clean boots. You can't clean, you know, anything, right? But we then want them to go out in front of 50,000, get absolutely slaughtered, and then get on their phone and get slaughtered on their phone as well. And you go, well, how are you going to build that resilience if they can't even handle exactly. cleaning a pair of boots once in a while? You know, so I think there's just a, there's a balance. I think we've gone, football's gone too far towards this total fluid education. And it's kind of, they've almost drawn out of these youngsters the, 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 the feel and the desire of what it is, you know, to just work and be a professional and the hits you have to take, you know, the, the mental hits you have to take. And, and they've almost pulled that out of people. So some people have it naturally. We all know that. Some of the best players, just, they've just got this natural toughness. So they don't need that. But what about some of the players who are sitting on that knife edge? You can actually almost talk them out of it by mollycoddle them too much, they actually need a bit of toughness. They need a bit of a push. So, I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm quite passionate about that because I think the game's gone too far with it. I really do. I think they've got to drag it back a little bit and start getting these kids. You know, it's the old favourite. <clears throat> Something I'm renowned for as a manager is doing 
they call it Gaffer's Day in pre-season. And it started with the youth team at Watford, where some of the coaching, the late Dick Bay, who's a friend and, and a great coach, and Davy Dodds, who were there, they said they're not working hard enough. And I said, well, they don't know how to work hard. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, they've never been worked hard enough to know what hard work is. You don't know what you don't know. So I used to run them, and I mean run them. I mean run them until it hurt them. And then I used to explain it afterwards. I used to get them in a room and go, right, how did that feel? And they'd start telling you, and they'd start going, wow, I've never felt anything like that. I said, yeah, well, that's hard work. That's how hard work feels. So it's like an education through the reality of what the life in football is going to offer you. Because if you're prepared to do that hard work, I'll tell you, you'll get found out, and you'll have a three-year career, and then will be playing non-league or something. Whereas if you want to stay in the game properly all the time, you've got to stay fit. You've got to know. You've got to be able to handle the knocks. So I think there's a process that could be better. Um, so I think it's out of counter at the minute. I totally agree with you, Daiji. And I, I, that, what you just said there, I call it tough love. I mean, yeah, I, I, coach, I coach girls and that, that hard work, I run them every single session and they know Ooh. it's coming every single session but I said girls the, you're you're uncomfortable you feel sick you have this little voice in your brain telling you that oh this is too hard I want to get but listen don't listen to it right you'll get yeah. used to this right and you'll get fitter and you'll soon see the difference now in games when we are running over teams literally in the last 15 20 minutes and they've just got used yeah. to it now yeah resilience so you, you you have to work at resilience it's not it's not something that I don't believe you can just read it in a book and suddenly you're resilient you have to know how resilient for you. You have to build it within yourself. And I think there's a lot of that. And I just think, like I say, not going all the way back to the, you know, the stuff that we did when you just ran until you were sick. I don't mean that type of stuff. I mean, that building process of letting your body know this is the truth of hard work. And when you've got it in you, you know it subliminally. And when you need it in a game, it'll be there for you. You can deliver yeah. it. So, and I still do that same process with the first team players at Burnley. Every preseason, we do the manager's day. And other managers have asked me about it. It's really funny, you know. Gary Rowe, I remember Gary Rowe, right? He said to me, he said, Dodge, he said, I've heard you do this like Gaffer's Day. And I was going, yeah. And he went, yeah, but I've heard like you just get them on the clock for two hours and they just they just keep working. Anything you say, they have to do. And I, yeah. And he was going, no way. No way. I go, yeah, it's true. And he was going, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And I went, yeah, that's what I do. And I said, I don't even flinch. I go, there's no argument. I just go, you're doing it. And I said, if you don't want to do it, help yourself. Just pull out now go in the treatment room help yourself but Marv will tell you the beauty of them days is once you've done it and you lock it in with all your teammates it's there and you buzz off it all that buzz off it once it's done they're going oh wow that was unbelievable you know it's just the trepidation and the anxiety but that's what yeah. I'm about for young players they've got to feel that they've got to feel that thing that it is you know that demand the truth of what it is to be a professional sportsman and some of them just don't get it and they, they drift out of the game needlessly, in my opinion, because they've yeah. just never been educated in what it really feels like to really work hard. So who of your current playing group that you're a manager of, who do you think secretly looks forward to those manager days? Yeah, I know what you mean. There's always a few competitive ones with the challenge. You know, Marvel <laughs> yeah. There's always a few runners and riders who, Marvel say the funniest thing in pre-season that we used to love in my, my generation, if you like, people that come back after the close season, they go, I've done nothing. I ain't done nothing. I ain't done nothing. They'll be at the front by about like a mile, and you'd be going, "Yeah, right. Of course you haven't done nothing." And it's like this weird <laughs> secret kind of code, you know, like I'm getting, getting fifteen in the beat test, or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I've been on the treadmill for six weeks, and they're making out they've yeah. been eating burgers for six weeks, and been to Magala for five, you know. And then they go, you start to run it. There'll be miles at the front. So yeah. you know, you get that kind of weirdness. To now, it's different now. Don't you know the players look after themselves more. But yeah, we got a few here. I take it on. They know it's coming now, so they they just like take it on, absolutely take it on. And I and I'm guessing now, Daisy. I mean, because you'll probably get this from the results, from what you do with the obviously the heart mantras and the fitness stuff. No one literally goes away at the end of the season, does nothing, and comes back a player. In, oh, I'm no. thinking now, no one can. You couldn't do that now. No, no chance in a million well, years. Our players, right? It's it's the weirdest thing in football. We have like uh, say a six week preseason. And actually, they're probably fit in four days because they're so high fitness level now. Right. But within four or five days, it's more about just getting the brain and the body realigned because they're fit. They're just kind of, you know, silly things, Marv, you know, like soft toes and that. You know, you've been off and you've been running, you're running shoes. You get like soft toes. So when you're kicking yeah. the ball after about a week, your toe feel like they're going to fall off, you know. So them little things. It's more the detail in the planning now, you know, the technical and tactical side. That's the bit that's important in pre-team because these lads come back really fit, really fit already. Can you imagine? No. Right. So anyway, we digress. Sorry. Left left midfielder. 
So, okay, we'll jump over to the left side. So, a player, um, young player I play with, still a, a big friend of mine today. Um, trust him as a bloke as well as a footballer. Tough, but could play. Had a great career. Big clue, but I think it's fair to give you one. Um, he started with me because there was a number of good players. They started, or I started playing with him at Millwall as a young player. He was in the first team, very young, 18. Went on to have a fantastic career. And tough, but but could play as well. Was, was he... Uh, in Irish international, yes, oh, and, Nick, and, and his, nickname, his nickname because of that, because obviously he's not the most Irish person you'd ever meet. No. Have you got it? Have you got it? Um, Andrew, I was gonna go for an Aussie, I was gonna go Aussie Should this go, until I mean, you until you said Irish. I was gonna go, um, Timmy Cahill, you, well, you, loosely, loosely Irish, as we, we do a yeah. bit of stick about it. I might not. I might not have it right. Actually, did he go to Liverpool as well? No, that was Lucas Neal. Lucas Neal went to Liverpool. I thought this one went to Liverpool. Well. He played. Oh, he, he went to the Premier League though. Don't get me wrong. Played lots of games in the Premier League. Well, I'm going to just say it then because it could be wrong. Um, Mark Kennedy. Oh no, no, I missed him. I missed him at Mill. <laughs> Stephen Reid. Yes. Oh, and Tottenham. Uh, the old, Reed, is he Tottenham? Did he end up at Tottenham? Is that Reid? Nicknamed him Stephen Stephen O'Reid. Because he was the least sort of Irish player that you could imagine, and he used to love it. He used to buzz off it. Um, now, what a player! Brilliant lad as well. Real, real big friend of mine in football. Still is. Um, I had him. I got him at right at the end of his career. I brought him into Burnley more for the education of the group because he'd been around the Premier League a long time. Honestly, as a young player, I was very fortunate at Millwall. Um, I told you there was like me and Stuart never caught some of the older players, but some of these young lads coming through. Two. I just mention it just because I think they deserve it. But there was two young players who would have, I'm sure, had great careers. Centre half called Joe Dolan, who had the worst injuries I've ever seen. He had two broken, uh, no, a broken leg and two cruciates, almost back to back. And Richard Sadlier, Richard Sadlier, what a player he was going to be. Yeah. Tall, tough, could run, handful, and unfortunately had a hip injury that cost him. Um, and then two. Amongst other players there, Stephen Reid being one of them, Lucas Neal and I mean, they were top. You know, you just knew it as soon as I saw them. I was in Division One at the time, by the way. Honestly, I went to Millwall and I was like, oh my goodness. I thought, we'll, we'll absolutely run away with this. And weirdly, we didn't the first year, but the second year we did. We, we, you know, smashed the division and no wonder. But what a player. Could play about five different positions. Tough. You know, ended up playing right back. He played, when I played with him, he played left-sided, sort of like a tucked in sort of wide man, really. Um, could play right, could play right back. Like, honestly, fantastic athlete and, a, and just a brilliant pro. And still is, still is a brilliant pro now. Excellent. So what was he? So you said he was called O'Reed, did he? And you said he took the banter quite well, though. No, it's, well, it's just the old, old Irish joke. Yeah. You know, you put O in front of their name. You know, what I mean, O'Reilly. Where was he born? Where was he born then? London. No, uh, yeah, like Kingston upon Thames or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, Battersea <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> brilliant. brilliant. He's the buzz off it because he's now. With Steve Clark in the Scottish squad, so that buzz off that as well. You know, what I mean, Jake, Jake has some Scottish names in that. You know, what I mean, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said tartan through and through and all that. You know, what I mean, we were like used to say about the Irish squad, you were through and through, and he, yeah, not a problem. You know what I mean? Great man, great man. Fantastic. So I'll move on to central midfield. Yep. So, right. So a, a, a div I've kind of gone like to give you a clue. I've kind of gone defensive midfielder and attacking midfielder. So this is more of a defensive midfielder. Um, Solid, reliable, very calm manner as a as a sort of person, but very competitive. Come through the lower, had to work hard in his career, come through the lower levels of football. Um, tough, good physically, good style, good stature. Um, very, very good and matured later in his career, actually. You know, the, the steady early career, lower leagues. And then when he got to where I played with him, just kept going and going and going. Uh, the biggest clue is uh, he's another one, unfortunately, he was down the road with me when I was down the road. Oh. You've definitely played against him, Marv, without a shadow of a doubt. You might even know him because, you know, our past... I probably, I, probably, I probably do, but like I said, that team down the road, my mind goes blank. It gets cloudy. It gets really, like, foggy. My, no, my brain gets foggy. I'm, all right, you tried that one. All right, everyone knows, Marv. <laughs> <laughs> Matty Spring. No, it's a good shout though because he did cross over, didn't he? He, he crossed came over, over, yeah. Yeah. I play with Matty and uh, with Marv. I play with Matty and with Marv. The same, is, it, is it the same sort of like age? Are we looking at Springy? No, uh, slightly older. Oh. Tough, yeah. good, good physically. Tough. 
Oh, oh, got promoted when they got uh, promoted under AD AD Boothroyd, a really important player in that season when they got promoted to the Premier League and then played in the Premier League under AD Boothroyd. I'd left by then, obviously. Where did Tommy Smith play? Was he a striker? Uh, Yeah, well, yeah, Tommy Wide, striker. Mm. Ah. I haven't got it. I I probably will get it when you say... Tommy would have made my side on the right side, but I just fought with Kevin Davis. I just fought, you know... So the player Go on, is Go on. Gavin Mar. Gavin Mar. Was he at Tranmere? No, Gavin Mar was with me at Watford. He was. Um, All right, Mar. Where did he go? He was, uh, he was at Hereford as a youngster. I think he might have gone through okay. Brentford or something like that. But Gavin, Gavin Mar at Watford, particularly, was, I mean, another one, team player, underrated, fit, strong, could play more than people thought. He had a brilliant season the season Watford got promoted to the Premier League under Boothroyd, Andy Boothroyd. And then was one of the better performers in the Premier League, which is difficult, obviously. Yeah. Um, but no, when you play with these guys, you know, another one I thought, what a good player you are. Could read it, was strong, was tough, could play, did all the basics well. And he said he was defense, he was a box to box midfielder, though. Well, more defensive, he'd screen, he'd work, he'd work from behind the ball more, not so much, you know, big on the goal scoring side, but big on the team play side. Yeah. Leader those people, those people who haven't heard of him before, who would you liken him to in the modern day game? Oof, I don't really know. Um, because obviously the game's changing all the time. Mm. I, don't, I don't really know, but just um, uh, it's hard to imagine who would well, say like uh, the role that maybe a Matic plays. He's not the same type of player, but you know, Matic, he's more work than behind the ball, good in front of the defense, can clean things up, good physically, you know, covers the yardage. More that style of player. Back in Still, the day, something like what Michael Essien did, that type of thing. That type of thing, yeah. Break it up, give yeah. it, you know, simple, but do a really good team job. Yeah. Sorry, Marv. No, I was, I was going to say about uh, central midfield. I mean, you signed um, Joey Barton, um, who, who, who a lot of people could say was is a difficult character. But I think one of the biggest things for me, not knowing Joey Barton or or anything like that, is that you as a person, Daishi, would be straight down the line. And that I'm just guessing now something that Joey Barton would like rather than being told a lot of BS, to be fair, by a manager say, yeah, I want to sign you, blah, 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 and then literally go back on their word and say, well, look, I didn't, I didn't want to get you here, but now it's going to be this way. I think it, it worked, didn't it? Basically, it worked with you and, and Joey, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, it's spot on. He, he's, um, he's an interesting character, but in a good way. I met him in my house because um, it was too obvious we'd get spotted somewhere. So he came up to my house in Northampton. Um, we had about three hours. Um, and you're exactly right, Marv. I just told him the absolute truth as I saw it, warts and all, but told him the positive truths of what I believed it could be for us and how important it would be. Um, had a bit of lunch with him, liked what he had to say, very knowledgeable. He's a very knowledgeable football guy. He, he knows about tactics, he knows about players, fantastic knowledge, actually, of players. Um, he shares views with you. And I told him exactly that, Marv, you're spot on. I just said, listen, Joey, the thing is, I'm incapable of BS. You won't be getting any of that. I'm going to tell you the truth. And he can take the truth, my eye. You can speak to him in a really blunt manner. He doesn't cry about it. He'll just go, yeah, OK. You know, he'll accept it. Right. And really, I think the clinch was, I said to him... Um, I said, look, Joey, I said, I've got to be honest. The thing is about you, you think you know everything about everything. And I said, there can't be two of us in the building, mate. So that was the bit. <laughs> that, uh, and he just burst out laughing. And he, I could tell it. I just thought, yeah, he's in. And uh, so we shared a few truths about what I thought. And he was absolutely terrific. I mean, he even had a few of my, my sort of leading pros here, like Ben, me and Tommy. And you know that one when they go, Gaffer? I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not sure on that one, you know what I mean? Within two or three weeks... They were all over him. They were like, yeah, he'll fit us without a shadow of a doubt. He was professional. He was honest. He was different class for us on the pitch, I'll tell you now. People were trying to boot him to wind him up, get him involved with things. Stayed solid as a rock. He was That season we signed him and Andre Gray, and without them two signings, we wouldn't have got re-promoted. It gave us, a, it gave us something different. It gave us a spark, and it gave everyone a lift again. And uh, right. he, was, he was outstanding for us. That's brilliant. Andre Gray, you keep mentioning all these people who play for both clubs. There's actually a lot, isn't there? Yeah, these are lately, though. These are not the ones back in. Yeah, but you've got to remember that... No, just put your mind on that, though. Don't forget a lot of these players was my top level I played at was the Championship. Well, so it's fair yeah. to say you're probably going to be playing with your top level players that you played with because they were in the Championship and they were good players. You know what I mean? Some, some, yeah. and a lot of what I've mentioned, by the way, of course, 
even the ones you wouldn't know as much. Paul Robinson played in the Premier League regularly. Mark Williams played in the Premier League regularly. Lloyd Doyley played in the Premier League a few times. Well, you know, a couple of seasons. Alec Chamberlain did. Kev Davis did. You know, they've all had their time. You know what I mean? They're, they're some good players. Not big names, but good players. Trust me. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's in their play for both Luton and Watford. That's what Luton I mean. Yeah, yeah, I mean yeah, yeah, there's yeah. actually a lot of people who've swapped over both clubs. That's, and you don't yeah. realise it as fans. Yeah. Kaishi did. Springy did. Alex did. I mean, I mean, like you said, then Andre Gray. I mean, there's quite a few when you think about it. Yeah. Yes, sadly. Um, okay, oh, so attacking one. let's go. Let's go with the attacking. So, right, this is my personal best player. For different reasons, I argue the best player I played with. Um, I always describe to people that if in Marvel T, in, in like small sided games in training, if he's on your team, you're going to win virtually every day. Um, he's fantastic athlete before his time I believe as an athlete I was amazed he didn't move earlier but he got injured at a really important time which stopped him moving I believe went on and had a fantastic career in um, in the Premier League um, from his start club which was with me at Millwall oh international hmm. footballer you mentioned him already haven't you I think I've mentioned him probably will oh, did you go did he go to Everton Yes. And he's from my oh. neck of the woods over here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mentioned him earlier. Uh, Timmy Cahill. Tim, Tim Cahill. Yeah, I mean, Timmy, Timmy, when I went to, he was very young. He was, he was 17, 18, borderline. High, high talented group of youngsters, which I've mentioned with Stephen Reid and, 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 and some heroes, Robbie Ryan and, and, you know, Dave Livermore in midfield and these guys. I'm telling you, I thought, what a player he is. What a player. And, and at a young age, I was amazed. You know, I thought, I mean, now I think it had been bought within six months. And I played there for a couple of seasons. And I saw him developing. I saw him in training. I'm telling you now, he could score off either foot. Brilliant right. athlete. Could head it, could head it as well as anyone I've seen. And there's one other player who makes my team who was the only one I've ever seen head it like him. Um, athletically good. Could play either foot, by the way. Could play. Good decision maker, real winner's kind of desire. Um, I, I can't say enough good things about him as a player. I mean, he, he's arguably one of the best players I played with, I think, because when you see him at club close, and personally you think, as a young player, I thought, what a player. And I, and I similar with, I must say, Stephen Reid was like that. When he was young, I thought, cool, what a player he is. You know what I mean? Um, Rolls Royce, I thought, Timmy. And he went on and obviously done fantastic things for, for Australia, you know, the, the Roos and stuff like that. Fantastic things for Everton. And you know, had a full career carried on playing to like 37, 38. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's that's a good midfield, that I'd say. One who's going to oh, do you, sort of you, hit the nail, you, yeah, yeah, you hit the nail on the head by saying he wouldn't he wouldn't be around as long as he was at that Millwall in this day and age. He was scoring oh, goals for fun. When he, well, he, he was not, he would he not be like, around as. I mean, you don't see it anymore, Marvel. Very rarely no. you get players who attack the box from midfield. He would attack the box. He like had a radar. I'm telling you, he'd just see it and he'd set off. And, and I was playing behind him, so I used to see him set off. And I used to, I used to almost be thinking, here, here it comes. He's going to score. It was like you just thought he's going to yeah. go right behind the box and score. Honestly, arriving in the box, poof, as good as I've seen. No wonder David Moyes used to. Have, well, David Moyes, if you remember, had yeah. Fellaini up there, and he'd almost say to Simi Cow, "Just you, just keep arriving in the box." Yeah. Timmy, Timmy would get like. I know it doesn't sound a lot, but in Premier League, well, Timmy would get like I don't know, like eight, ten, twelve a season. I mean, that's amazing for right. a midfielder in the Premier League. You look now, there's not many midfielders scoring like that in the Premier League, I tell you. Especially that aren't no. set pieces. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I'm set pieces to get to that stage. Midfield. I'm riding from yeah. midfield. That's the thing. Not, not a number 10. He was playing in midfield. Yeah. I'm riding from midfield. Different if you're a number 10. That's different. The only one I can remember back in the day, like similar, would be David Platt. A right, like a, a midfielder yeah. arriving. No, it's a good shout. It's a good shout, yeah. David Platt. You know, both players kept it quite simple. Timmy wasn't yeah. doing flicks and tricks all the time. He was just doing the, the basic, good, high-level basics, I call it. Doing the basic things, but doing them top class. They're what yeah. a player. Great and he's, he's, he's an absolute legend over here um, in Australia. He's, I mean, he's he seen as... Didn't he go for the record in the last World Cup? Couldn't he have made it the only player to score in four World Cups or yeah, something like yeah, that? Yeah. yeah, and he scored some amazing diving headers in Brazil mm. and scored one against the Dutch. Um, from yeah. outside the box, um, I think some people remember. And I, I remember him playing for Everton 
and he scored. And as you're talking about running in from the back post, I remember Stephen in the back post in the 119th minute and winning it in extra time from in the oh, some what? League Honestly. Cup game or Carling Cup game or something. I can't describe to you how good as a young player. He's like 18, 19, playing in first team, playing in men's football in a yeah. side that, you know, at the end of the day, we were in a side that were pushing for promotion. It did. We won the title that year. And I just thought, oh, I thought this kid's going to go all the way. And I just couldn't believe how Nolan had come in quicker, you know. Yeah. And he seemed to drag on. And then he did his knee. And typically a Timmy, he come through a cruciate as if it was nothing and got playing again and then got a move to Everton. And I just thought, oh, what a player. And I'm surprised he never went on to play for some of the the top, top, top. Because Everton were kind of a fifth place shoo-in every year, weren't they, back then? I'm surprised he never yeah, made it still, or at least had a chance you know, to go. Well, going back to Joey Barton, though. So, Joey Barton, he, he had some funny things. So, people used to say, you know, like, Joey Barton, he's a bog-standard Premier League player. Joey Barton said, I'd take a bog-standard Premier League player any day of the week. You know, he's <laughs> like, people get how hard it is to play in the Premier League. And people like Timmy Cale, my point is, like you just suggested, he didn't really go to the superpowers. But he's in a team that were finishing in Europe and that, at Everton. Trust mm-hmm. me, to be in them clubs, you've got to be some player to play as often yeah. as he did. I mean, he'd be first name down on the team sheet for like five seasons or whatever at Everton. Top player. Yeah, top player. Yeah. Very <laughs> true. So we've gone to strikers. You mentioned you're playing a number 10 because you weren't sure if you were playing 4 4 1 1. Well, four, I mean, nowadays it's all the modern jumbo land. You know, there have always been players who come off the front. Marvel Tay, you know, being a 4 yeah. 1 floating number nines. It's all nonsense, by the way. So, you sound, you like, know, Mike, you is, sound like Mike Newell doing this. Here we go. Really? Go on, Marv. Explain, the, explain what happened with Mike Newell. Really, I mean, I know you're a busy man, but listen, if you're in the car a lot, you should you should listen to a couple of these um these um episodes. <laughs> Newly's right is unbelievable, Daishi. He's just literally it just goes on the, off on these tangents, and I was just like waiting for the moment, and he's and, and just loading the gun, and he was just like gone. It was like he started saying about he goes, between the lines, this guy, and they're talking about playing between the lines and well, he goes what's it the corridors or next is going to be what, what, what what's going on he said it's just absolutely nonsense absolute yeah, nonsense. i mean i mean don't get me wrong we, we all drop it in now and again to describe a moment but the, the the truth right so to give you a view of it you know everyone's got to be a tactical genius now and i and i you know in many interviews i've said well i'll tell you what i said people tell me about these modern fullbacks and he's number 10 and all that i said I was at Nottingham Forest in 1987. 1987, two centre half split, two full backs went on. Deep line midfielder Neil Webb tried to get the ball. Steve Odger tried and stretch the, stretch the pitch. The two wide players, one Franz Carr had played wide because he was so quick. Brian Weiss had come inside. Nigel Clough had come off the front at like a number 10. And Lee Chapman had either hold it up or Peter Davenport had run the pitch long. I mean, this is as modern as you ever get. It's like, it's like the stereotypical academy version of football. I go, so. Yeah. Don't start trying to baffle me with modern sayings of rotation and, you know, like like recycling the ball and all that. I'm going, yeah, we've heard it all. You know, it's just a different... But, you know, you can just say, keep the ball, not recycle yeah. it, just keep the ball, you know. So it, it's, kind of, it's kind of, like I said earlier about academies, it's kind of taking away the jumbo and giving them the truth. You know, you don't need all the mumbo-jumbo, just give them the truth. And then yeah. now and again, you might drop a, a better way of saying it to describe a moment better. I get that, you know. I, some of it is absolute waffle, Antonio. We is. have to listen to it, some of us. Not all of us. Some people love that waffle and managers go out there telling the world about their waffle. But we just go like, yeah, okay. So we all know what it means. That's the point. So anyway, I agree. behind that, centre forwards. Centre forwards. Yes, centre forwards. So two different types of centre forwards. So that was my point. It's not about four four two or false number nine, just two completely different types of forwards. Or I think not only were they top players, but together would be a, a proper pair of strikers. So the first one, um, I, I linked it slightly. A big clue is he could, he's the only person I've seen that had it better than Timmy Cale. He could edit like no one I've ever seen. He scored a famous goal um, in a cup game against Chelsea where he outlet the keeper who came out, outlet above him and just powered in a header, in which I played in that game, uh, famous for the, the club, if you go in at that time. Marv, you definitely want to come across him. Tough, uh, hardy, could run a bit, could play a bit, and could find a goal without any shadow of a doubt. And a gr- brilliant fella as well. I'm trying to think about the um, the leap, the header. That's why I'm, trying, I'm really trying to dig deep into the back. The, the other obvious clue, the other obvious, the obvious clue I can give you, or not that obvious, but he is an international footballer, but for a much smaller country. Ah, very small. Yes. Yes. 
Oh. His name begins with H H, Marv. I reckon. No. Blank. Is that Heider Helgerson? It is Heider Helgerson. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He was. Ice, is he Ice? Was, Ice Fandic? Yeah, yeah. Another yeah. one. You know, I got on with him as a lad as well. Great, great character. Um, but what? Honestly, another one. You played with him and. He was he was up there with arguably the most horrible trainers I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> I, I, certainly, right. So if you if you had these players in a group, I'd be picking Timmy Kayla. I wouldn't be picking Ida. I'd be going, no, Ida, you go on the opposition, mate. Don't worry about that. He was a brilliant training <laughs> player when you marked him because he was rubbish. So I just thought, great. But you get him on that first team pitch. Oof, he used to come to life, and I used to think, what an handful you are. I mean, I saw him score goals and headers. Tough, as tough a person as I've seen on a football pitch. But like I say, not nasty tough, just tough in his right. manner. Would take a hit for you. He'd get hold of the ball. He'd run. He'd head it. Great team player. And just a, just a, a great character as well. But what, you know, another one. I mean, don't get me wrong. I can't really say he's under eight because he obviously went on played in the Premier League. He played at Fulham and stuff like that. International as well, mind you. Yeah. I'm sorry? As an international, he played for Iceland. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so yeah, he's yeah, not yeah. 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 Yeah, he played, he played in the Premier League um, at QPR as well. Helped them get promoted to the Premier League and played in the Premier League. Helped Cardiff get promoted to the Premier League. I mean, you know, real, real good player. Real good team player, but, but was a better, and a, what I call an effective player. So not, like Timmy Cattell had class about him dealing with the ball and everything. Heidi was just an effective player, highly right. effective player. So he was good for that reason. Um, and a great lad as well, real character. So yeah, Heidi helps. Was he relaxed like the Icelandics quite often are, or was he... Um, no, I know no, you say he was. I know you say he was the, wasn't the best trainer, but oh, he was funny in training. He just like uh, he just used to buzz of. If you're marking him in training, you'd be buzzing. You think, oh, easy life today. See the one, the one I missed out who could fit in this team. Who was who was the opposite? Who was a really good trainer. I liked him a lot. And a good player. He's a very unlucky to not make my team. Was Tommy Smith? Because you mentioned him earlier. Tommy Smith. I'm telling you, good player. Really, really good player. Good footballer. Pace, movement. Really good player. He's probably the arguably one of the more, more unlucky ones I've made me take. Um, but yeah, him and uh, sorry, I was just mentioning because Tommy Smith used to play up front with Ida Elkson sometimes, you know, it's right. like a number 10 as it is, like we were talking about, and Ida Elkson as the out and out number nine. Uh, good connection there. But Ida Elkson. Interesting player. And, and striker, who's next to Ida Elkson? Last but not least on my team was a player who wasn't like Ida, clever, wily. Although didn't have pace, saw it quickly and ran hard, very fit. Um, super manner about his performances, always on the move, always alive. Had some real tough personal challenges in his life. Um, and came through all that and just a top fella. And I, I felt was very unfortunate because of what happened to him in his personal life. I think he would have gone on to be certainly an even bigger player, not necessarily, look, you can never decide whether they're true, true Premier League players, but certainly a bigger player and have a bigger career than what he ended up having. Although, I must say, he had a very good career. Where, where were you playing with, with him? So I played with him, yeah, sorry, I, I played with him at Millwall. Mm. Oh. Same era as Timmy Cahill and Stephen Reid and Stuart Nevercott. Were you there when Chris Armstrong was there? No. Oh. I'm going back to Carl Emerson then. That's why, I, I mean, I was thinking Chris Armstrong. So so even big, well, the biggest clue I can give you, um, well, no, there's a few big clues, is record goal scorer for Millwall. He overtook Teddy Sheridan, I think it was. Oh, no. You played against him, Mark, definitely. He not, had two um, spells. Like, I know, yeah. Not a um, little... Neil Harris? Neil Harris. Neil Harris, yeah. Neil Harris. Chopper. Yeah. Chopper Harris. Yeah. Yeah. He was... He was a good... Hey, out and out, good player. Very good player. Goal scorer. Yeah. Just, well, he come out of non-league. Um, he come out of non-league like a couple of seasons before I got to Millwall. Yeah. Sort of raw, but, 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 but ready. You know, wanting to, wanting to run, wanting to play, wanting to hassle you. And he just got better and better and better. I mean, he could, he could score in the box, out the box. Clever finishes. He was one of the first ones I saw. He had like a reverse, like a drag almost. He, he, you know the one, Marv, when they opened the goal up as if yeah. they were going to shut and then he drag it into the near stick, you know. Really clever finish. And he's he quite chirpy as well, isn't he? 
It's great. Well, it's great like it. yeah, for his yeah, size, it. you know what I mean? It'll give, give you a little bit, wouldn't it? Great ball, yeah. beer, balls, wouldn't it? He went through testicular cancer when I was there. That's it was right. such, a big, such a big thing at that time. We were like properly shocked. And you don't know how to treat, we, you know, we didn't know how to treat that moment as, a, as people. But we had a real tight knit at Millwall. It's probably the closest sort of club I was hand in glove with, you know, with a, when you, I just fit the, the group and the mentality as yeah. sort of one of the older players. And we had a real tight knit with people like Chopper. And we were all a bit, you know, we didn't know how to handle it. You know, he got told he got testicular cancer. He rang me. I remember I was in, I was in, with my now wife, I was in Maui, I think, and he rang me in the summer and he rang me and I was, I didn't even know what to say. I was like, my goodness, because obviously you hear that word. I mean, yeah, you know, all the, the, the way cancer treatment is amazing now, but yeah. you know, you hear that word and you're like, wow, you know, it's a young guy as well. Yeah. And uh, thankfully they got it early, sorted everything out and he actually came back and this is, so this is, links the story of Alex Chandler. He came back and his first proper game back against, uh, Alec Chamberlain was in goal for Watford and I was at Millwall. He runs through and bends one in the top corner around Chambo. And it's a famous, it became a mural at the ground at, at Millwall where they showed it with us all pointing at the screen. Because not only did he score, they put it on the big screen. So we were, we'd just seen it and then we saw it on the big screen. And I sent it to Chambo on, a, you know, on your phone. I sent it in the clip of it yeah. just the other week and I don't have that. <laughs> so brings it full circle back to the beginning with Alec Chamberlain. So yeah, yeah. Neil Alex, what a what a player. What a player. And, and, I mean, it, it, like I said, it wasn't that period, I think. He still had a great career, but if it wasn't that period, yeah. I think he'd have gone on to even bigger. Because he went to like Nottingham Forest and back to Mill, did brilliant back at Mill. He did brilliant twice, you know, first time right. and the second time. Um, can you, can you imagine now? He's just left off, yeah. I was just, yeah. oh, did he? Oh, yeah. dear. Because yeah, okay. he was at Millwall for right. years, wasn't he, as a manager? So Yeah, well, yeah, he did well at Mill for... Four years, I think it was. Yeah, like yeah. Four, four and a half years, yeah. Great lad, great lad. Still a good friend of mine still now, uh, but a good player, really good player. Them two, if you had Hyder and him, I'd say it. With Timmy flying in the box. Yeah. <sighs> got a chance there. So, honourable mentions. Who are you? Have you got any honourable mentions you mentioned? I know you mentioned... Well, Marv, I've got to mention Marv. You know, Marv, was, Marv was a good guy. Not saying it, but not just saying it. Good, great guy, great for me accepted me as his partner straight away. No weirdness, not sort of, oh, you don't do this, don't that, just kind of dodge this, how we do it, this is how we play. Knew Luton like the back of his hand, rightly so, so that helped me, you know, because I'm straight in with him and he's like settling me down and everything's cool, you know. Um, really good to play with Marv. I actually really enjoyed physically playing with him as well as being around him and his group, you know what I mean? Like real good characters there, nice feel about it. And it was a really important time to my career because I'd had such a terrible time at Bristol City. I learned a lot from Bristol City, but I had a real bad time. So going into Luton at that time was really important to me. It could have been make or break. You know, your career either goes that way or that way. And um, like I say, Marv had that brilliant way about him of making me look a lot better than him. So that was, I was accepting that easy. I like dribbling too much. So you, you're always there with your little dustman and brush. I got your Marv, I've got your Marv. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Marv used to carry out defence and that. And I'm like, where's he going? What was he, what's he doing? I was just going, oh, Marv, just pass it. Like that, I was screaming at him. But, uh, no, 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 so Marv definitely. Well, anyway, yep. back, if you don't mind, I'll give you a quick run through, right? Is that all right for the position? So goalkeepers, I was very fortunate. Tony Warner, terrific at Millwall. I really put Chamber in, top keeper, played 785 games Chamber, but he is a friend as well. Tony Warner, fantastic in my period with him at Millwall. Been really fortunate. My goalkeeping coach here at Burnley called Billy Mercer. He played with me yep. in the team to the uh, Chesterfield semi final against Middlesbrough. Good so, I remember him. you know, um, good friends of mine, Mick Leonard, back in the day when I first started at Chesterfield. I mean, I've been really fortunate with keepers. Um, right back, Lucas Neal, without a doubt. Lucas Neal, what a good player. I mean, top, top player. No surprise to me that he went off to play in the Premier League and played lots of games in the Premier League. I mean, a top player. Um, Centre half's joking apart. Marv, I really enjoyed playing with Marv, but um, Neil Cox, as I said, I thought Neil Cox was an excellent player, really good player. Um, left backs, there was a there was a few. I mean, Robbie Ryan at Millwall, you know, very underrated, incredibly underrated player. Really enjoyed playing with him, but but I think Robbo Robinson, he he takes it for that one. On the wide, Tommy Smith, without a shadow of a doubt, really good player. Um, really enjoyed playing with him as well. You know, great lad. I don't see him very often now, but, but fantastic fella. 
um, midfield. There was a lad called Dave Livermore who was a mill, more like a, a break, broke up the play and allowed Timmy Cale to go into the box. Very underrated player. Gavin Marner mentioned, you know, top players. There was a few. I thought, Marv, I thought back in the day, Springy as a young player. Yeah. Now, Springy, had, Springy. Springy went on, don't get me wrong, I'm not doing him down a good career, but I thought, you no. know, I thought he's a top player. Could play, yeah. could run, you know, really could play. You know, I only had a small period. That's why I couldn't put people like that in the team. It's too small a period. Right. But I thought he was a very good player. Well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, trying to, I'm a bit confused. Was you not? Was, yeah, sorry. Was, was Roni not that far as with you? No, so we we were we were mates, but by, by default, Marvy, right. I was already at Forest. I was a young pro. Just as I left for, to go to Chesterfield after being on loan there, Woney moved into my digs because Forest agreed I could stay in my digs. Right, that's right. how we became mates. So he was actually coming into Forest. I was leaving Forest. I was he's older than me. I was uh, nineteen because I was a young pro at Forest. He was 21, 22. Okay. I would just became friends because we lived together in the same house, and we just became mates. Right. So, yeah, so the, our career sort of runs out that way. Right. It's fair, say, it's fair to say off the pitch, we were tight. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Round nine. We were all right with that bit. We sorted that bit out. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, midfield, um, wide left, Christoph Kinney I played with. Had a brilliant spell at Millwall. You know, another good player. Um, I mean, he, you know, even he's, he's tough. You know, there's that many, like I say, some of these guys, are, you wouldn't know their names, but when you play at the Marvel Theatre, there's players you play with, you know. Yeah. Incredibly underrated, incredibly underrated. And when you play with them, you think, you know, what good players like Greza. Greza was another one right back. Yeah. Of course. Greza, fantastic professional, very underrated. Well, not underrated because he had a really good career, but better Correct. player than most people I thought, you know, I believe. Kev Davis could go up front easily. You know, he could make your team up front. So there's so many of good mentions of so many players. I mean, I played for 20 years and I played at six, five, six different clubs. So, you know, varying players that I played with. But, um, and who's, no, and, no, and no, who's no. gonna and who's gonna manage this team? So obviously you got to pick a manager, and it doesn't have to be a manager who's was a manager. It could be a youth team coach. Some people have picked some people, and it could be any anyone who might have been an influence to you um, in your career. Who's gonna manage this team? Who are you gonna have to lead this well, team? As a now manager, I'd enjoy managing that team because I know them as characters, and they're they're a good group. I mean, not just players; they're yeah. a good group. Yeah. Um, but no. Um, I think through my years, ooh, John Duncan was amazing. John Duncan guy, I always tell this story because I think people don't really know John Duncan. John Duncan got a group of what I call average, a group of all rightness in a small little club like Chesterfield. And he molded it into a team that got promoted, got to an FA Cup sign, a uh, semi-final. And that, that club right Chesterfield, when I was there, had a hardly sold a player for years. Well, all of a sudden, Kev Davis went 750,000. I went for 375,000. Billy Mercer goes for 250,000. Paul Olin goes for 250,000. Blah, 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 blah. And I just look back on that and I think, wow, they did an unbelievable job making this unit. And I, I, a lot of my ideas came from that. So over my career, probably John Duncan, but more for getting the best out of everyone, you know, getting the best out of really skinny resources. And I've taken a lot of that thinking into here because we don't lead the market financially. So a lot of that thinking, the, the, the sort of thoughts behind it, building that team connection, that the way the team operates, a lot of that I've used from them times. Um, so, yeah, fantastic, I thought, you know, and, and a really, really good uh, manager. Oh, all of the managers, Marvel, say you learn something off all of them. Ray Lewington was excellent. I really liked Ray when I was at Watford. You know, very a bit of coach, coach Ray Harford, the late Ray Harford, of course, who yeah. was, who's, you know, Brilliant coach were under Mark McGee. Mark McGee was very good. You know, I've been very fortunate with my managers. I think they've all rubbed off on me in some way or the other, and I've nicked some ideas off all of them in one way or the other. So John Duncan's going to be the one to lead this team? John Duncan, John Duncan yeah. just because, like I said, he got an average group of people, players, and made us into a proper unit and helped our careers move forward. Excellent. So, I mean, I, I listen to a quite, I mean, I've listened to quite a few podcasts what you've been on and just listening if i didn't know you daishi and i'm not just saying this because obviously i know you and i've played with you but listening to how you speak and how you come across if i was playing today i'd want to play for someone like you as as my manager and i just want to ask you now what do you believe is the biggest thing for you which has made you the the good i say more than good great manager you are now what's the one thing which you think you have in your head thinking well this is what i want to be with my players what's the one thing which in your opinion has led you to be well first of all thanks for the kind words mate but the i think no. honesty 
I think honestly, you know, I, I, I just thought we were in an era when I just felt that you got told, do this, do that, do this, do that. And a bit of like, you know, I just, I always thought, just tell me the truth. Just tell me the truth. You know, soft truth, hard truth, whichever truth it is, just tell me the truth. So I, I just tell the players the truth. On every level of their careers, if they ask my advice, I give them a truthful answer. And not always the right, the right answer or the right, the answer they want to hear, but I tell them right. the truth. And I think over yeah. my time, even players who it hasn't worked out for or maybe left this club, they very rarely do I hear bad things, what, you know, that, how I've treated them. Very yeah, rarely. That's true. Do say they just go, yeah. oh, you know, he's fair. Um, yeah, so given honesty and, and fairness, I think it's a good start point, you know, when you're working with players. And if they know you're going to tell them the truth, I think it's a good start point, you know, a good base to work from. So I think, I think honesty is a really important, yeah. and respect yeah. as well. Respect, no, Ralph, because I, mean, I, I didn't like our era of getting screamed at and all that and called names. I never, by the way, it's just a little insight. I never, mm -hmm. ever, ever have called any of my players a name, as in a name about them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, mark. You know, I know. never <laughs> called a player a name. I've asked them about their what they're doing and I've put pressure on about what they're doing. I've never called a player a name. Never accused that's them, never called them a name. No, that's great. No. Interesting. Honestly, I think you're right. Honesty is the biggest yeah. thing. I think you look back and you you hear so many. If you hear players talk, and like, especially there's a lot of these podcasts going around where I mean players are talking. You hear them say, "Oh, well, no, I don't like him. Oh, I didn't like him because he told me that." Do you know what I mean? It, it's it's so it's true. Yeah, he, he, what he told you that he went, "Yeah," but at the time, well, I don't think the go on. No, the hardest thing that I had with honesty, and, and I believe in it. So once I actually said to a player, I won't say which player, I left him out. And he said, why you left him out? And I said, look, because I believe in honesty, I'm going to tell you the truth. I've just got a feeling. I've just got a feeling. And I said, I know that sounds a rubbish reason to be leaving <laughs> out, but I can feel it that right. I'm making the right decision. And they couldn't accept at the time. They were like, how can you just say you can just feel it? But anyway, to be fair, years later, I met this player and he went, you were right. I said, you were right. He said, you know, I knew it. He said, I couldn't admit it then, but I knew at the time it was the right decision. Really? Yeah, because players, you know, Marv, as you get older, you get more they open know. about it. Yeah. When you're young, you really, you protect yourself. So, you you know, I said to the players, you, you, you put these layers of armour on. Sometimes you've got to be humble. You've got to take them layers of armour off and be a bit more vulnerable because that's how you move forward. Well, you don't learn it. It's your favourite, Marv, you know. You know, if I only knew now what I knew, if I only knew then what I knew now. <laughs> yeah. It's the oldest one in the book, but it's true. It's true. You know, and all the yeah. things that you've learned and all these experiences, you try and ex express these ideas to young players and they defend themselves. They put these barriers up. We like, to just take the barriers down. Just please listen and you'll, you'll, you'll move forwards quicker. And some do and some don't. And it's, we just try and take them layers out, you know, try and remove the layers and say, just trust us. We're going to be honest with you. Just trust us. And when it works, it works well. Well, Daishi, listen, I want to just say on behalf of Andrew and myself, thank you so much for doing it. And like, it just shows what a genuine, yeah, genuine guy you are. It's been fantastic talking to you and hearing about your Levin. It really has. Fantastic. Stay well. Yeah, thanks very much. And thank you very much. And that was Sean Daishi's My Best 11. Thank you, Sean.